Hello, everybody. Welcome to this community meeting for QWarden uh, for April. Uh, we are today, April um, 11th. And as usual, um, in these office hours, everybody is welcome. Um, everybody is invited to take notes during office hours, and everybody is invited to add topics to the coming sessions or this one. Um, one can find the, the document that we use for this is on qwarden.io at the bottom of the page, just by the calendar that uh, lists these sessions. And yeah, uh, for those that are um, not here right now and would watch this, of course you are watching this recorded and this ends up in YouTube and we hope that you enjoy it. So with that said, let's see what we have. Uh, today, we have uh, today with us Alex, we have uh, Jose and Martin from the QWarden team. I hope that you can see them. I don't know if uh, it rotates through the things, maybe not, but we will see each other, no? And let's go with the meetings agenda. Let me just share the screen. Okay, and now it should be setting. So as you can see in the agenda, we have um, some points. We have the 1.12 release. It's uh, still not released. It's an RC, but we will talk about what comes inside of the 1.12. Also, we have a new community repo that it's uh, useful for those contributing or wanting to contribute to Qwarden. I'm talking about contributions. We have uh, updates on the CNCF status of Qwarden and particularly on the on the last steps from going to, to Sandbox. And then we have an update to the container resource policy, which was uh, prompted by the community, which is super nice. And then we have also an update on the 1.13 release. It's still far away because we will release 1.12 this month, hopefully in the next weeks, and we can see what's coming there. Okay, so I suppose we can start no, with the with the first topic, which is the 112. For that, uh, we can say that we have an RC1 that it's al already being tested, and it contains several things. Uh, I'm thinking about the the pod dis disruption budgets uh, that we can start talking, and maybe just say I don't know if you are uh, you would be comfortable talking about that specific topic since you were driving it. Sorry, I just need to let for some moments what we are talking about specifically. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah, no, no problem, no problem. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, starting to to talk about the pod disruption budgets that we oh, yeah. uh, that we added to the to the contain to the container to the controller and so on. Yeah. So uh, for now, uh, users that uh, wants to use pod disruption budget with the policy server uh, deployments are able to do that. For that, we had the two new fields in the uh, policy server uh, CRDs, one for the minimal available number of replicas and the or the max unavailable uh, amount of replicas. And we use that fields to create the pod disruption budget in the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, it basically is the, it's just that you can define the values following the same that what you use it in the Kubernetes uh, resource. And that's it. You can, in, we have the documentation about it, explaining about that. The only caveat that we, maybe you, you saw while you try to do that, you cannot define both fields at the same time. You need to choose the minimum available number or the maximum available number. And this is a, a limitation for the PDBs uh, resource, so is nothing that we can do it about it. So, yeah, that's all. That sounds good. I'm also uh, seeing on the list the change, uh, the update on the RBAC, no, for being able to create the pod disruption budgets by the controller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, then we need to do that. Otherwise, you will not be able to create that. Yes. Thanks for reminding. Me. And I was, yeah, no, no problem. I was, uh, I was looking into it beforehand, and I was confusing myself. Uh, so all the policy servers pods get created in, inside of the QWarden um, namespace. Uh, that's correct, no? Yeah. Which means which means that then all the pod disruption budgets would be part of that QWarden namespace. So it's all controlled yeah. by the by the QWarden controller and you know by the other bag yeah. and so on. 
Perfect. Yeah. So then, uh, just as a, as a reminder, no? the, the policy server's uh, CRs, the resources get created in whatever namespace you want, and then Qboard then creates the pods in its own namespace, yeah. controlled by it, and so on. Okay. Yeah, yeah that sounds good. And this adds uh, quite the reliability, no? Um, usage when one is, um, I don't know, I'm thinking when one wants to evict uh, nodes or things like that, no? I mean. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That sounds good. Uh, on the same topic, we have affinity, which is quite related. No, I mean, this is all kind of like production settings for policy servers. And all of this is implemented in the controller. Maybe I can uh, talk about the, the affinity, given that I was uh, the, the one driving it. So for affinity, it's more or less the same. It's uh, quite simple. We have um... hmm. I don't see it here. But yeah, we have a spec dot affinity in the policy server that is new. And you can put there uh, a YAML object that matches what you would put for the pods, affinity and anti-affinity. So the usual um, required or or things like that. And yeah, I mean, this anti-affinity and affinity can be used as usual for trying to um, provide with more um, HA and reliability in the cluster. No, the pod reduction budgets are useful for when one um, manually uh, makes changes into into the nodes or the workloads and so on and, and affinity and affinity is more for having it uh, distributed or or closer and so on for us for policy servers the the good idea would be for example to have an anti-affinity setup so then they are distributed among uh, nodes or zones and things like that but yeah that's it we can uh, since we have some docs uh, later on i can just show uh, a bit of the docs on the on the draft that we have and we can go with that and then also we have uh, limits and requests this would be for the for the policy server containers no i mean the policy server create uh, the controller creates the pods and then the pods have the containers and then you can set the limits and requests for those um what can i say uh, as as the for us in policy servers, what matters more is uh, CPU and memory. Maybe not uh, paginating and so on because we don't do anything with with the uh, or or you know we don't do anything with a with the file system and so on. But yeah, CPU and memory. We can uh, set there the the limits. It's useful uh, to have them. One needs to be aware that if you undercommit the limits, you may introduce reliability problems. But yeah, that's uh, a bit of common sense. Okay, I'm gonna show super fast the the docs. It's a new doc page. Of course, as always, we we welcome uh, suggestions. So if you are seeing this and you would like to have something more documented or specifically uh, some feature more documented because you feel that uh, you would enjoy having more knowledge there, please just reach to us as always on Slack or um, yeah, GitHub issues. So for example, this would be uh, the documentation for the public disruption uh, budgets. You can see, as Jose was saying, no, we can set min available or max unavailable. And as you were saying, we can only specify one. And the same for affinity and anti-affinity. We can set the affinity and anti-affinity as, as a normal pod would do. You can he see here some examples. As I was talking for, for zones and host names and so on, some anti-affinity or only set them in control planes and so on. And this is for limits and requests. You can set the limits and requests, so as usual, as a container uh, would do. We have thought about adding more, um, let's say, knobs no, to, to policy server spec to allow for more things. There's some issues there. If you would like uh, to have more reliability knobs to configure policy servers, please get in touch. Okay, 
And by the way, about the wow. limits and requests, uh, we follow the same uh, spec that is used by Kubernetes like it. So you can use any notation that you use in your usual Kubernetes deployment and uh, with the policy server, right? Because we use the same objects to parse it. That exactly. Way. Yes, correct. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't do this. It was, no, uh, Fabrizio, if I remember. Yeah, uh, they accept the same uh, resource units from Kubernetes, the same that um, the min available and max unavailable yeah. accepts a percentage, no? Yeah, that's right. And so on. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we also, we are going to expose this in the, I mean, this is exposed in the hand charts uh, for the default policy server. For other policy servers, you would need to specify it on your own when you do the policy server spec. Okay. And all of this is already available, no? In an RC1, if I remember correctly. Which, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Do we have anything else in the 1.12 worth talking about besides, you know, normal uh, bugs? Here you can see, as usual, we have a keyboard and board uh, of uh, on, the, on the project. All of this is public. So if you are interested, uh, you can see what we are intending to, to achieve. Maybe sometimes we cut short things or other things get included. But yeah, this is what we try. Oh. Uh, I'm, for example, I remember now the um, there was a bug that is uh, not related to us, but we inherited. Yeah, this one. No, I mean this one is not for 1.12, but this is a bug in in Sixtor, an upstream bug in Sixtor, and all the um, consumers of Sixtor uh, via the Rust crate um, are hitting it, and it's basically a problem when when dealing with the with a with the variant with the variant of 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 the keys because in the past it used to be this kind of variant and now it's accepted also this so if the variant has changed with it, which it has changed then the key is not recognized how does it look for us uh, it looks like um, that we fail on on finding the, the signatures. This is done on purpose, no? Because we try to fail closed. So if there's a problem, we just don't recognize the key. Hence, we don't recognize the signature, and we just fail to verify. Even if everything is more or less okay, but we fail closed. And if I remember correctly, and maybe it was you also just say no that pointed this out on a on a blog post. I or... don't remember to be honest. I'm curious I now. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember, to be honest. Ah, oh, no, it was Flavio. Yeah. Flavio, yeah, known bugs. Yeah, we can see here. So, um, yeah, this needed some work upstream for Sixtor and for um, TAF, which is the the, the Rust crate that implements the thing for the, for the keys and, and so on. So uh, I don't know. I hope that it ends in a 1.11 patch, or maybe we just cut a 1.12 directly. Let's see. And I remember that today I just merged a fix in one OCI host, cap uh, my host capability to verify container images, which was not working yes. 100%, and a community report the issue. And it's already closed. You need to, to find for, for them. But basically, the verify host capability was not working as expected, so we fixed that, and I believe that we will release in the next RC. Yeah. That's super nice also. Yeah, I mean, if I show it like this, you can see that we have done quite the progress on 1.12. Um, let me yeah, see. It is 1.7, is number 15, yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is also super nice. This was a could find this come uh, this uh, was opened by a community user which is also uh, yeah i mean normally that's what drives us and yeah this was a problem no on using private registries and the easy, the, the the fix was quite um yeah succinct so i'm happy yeah. i have this one <laughs> yeah okay 
now that I'm looking at the done, uh, the done column of the 1.12, maybe there's something else that we can talk about. There's also some reliability things for, yeah, we had some uh, issues with, uh, with uh, the container resource policy that we're gonna talk about. And there's also something that has gone inside. Hmm, I don't find it now. Yeah, some works on end-to-end -end tests and integration tests. I kind of find now what I wanted to talk about, but yeah, I suppose it's fine. And I see Flavio has joined also the call. So if I may, uh, Flavio, I, we are talking about the 1.12 release and I'm talking about what's what's going in there. Yeah, we have talked about the reliability uh, improvements for policy servers, the bug fixes. We have talked talk also about the, the bug for Sigstore that is for 1.11.1. But it's also there, you know. So maybe that's it. Okay. Yeah, so then let's. Sorry. Sorry. Just in case, Flavio just tried to say something, but he's muted. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I had to restart the computer and the mic was uh, broken. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there, there is one thing that we also introduced, which is a uh, final optimization for oh, yes. the um, gatekeeper policies that make use of uh, context aware information. So, this is the final, uh, the last uh, optimization we, we can do in this area. That is the one uh, that I can foresee. So yeah, this is something that the community has asked and um, it's going to be part of 1.12. Yep, quite important. Okay. Yeah, I think that maybe that's gonna close the, the 1.12 topic. So uh, moving to the next topic, uh, for now we can talk about the community repo. This is a new uh, repo, here it is, keyword and dash community. This was mainly driven by Jose as as yeah uh, as the person that uh, dropped this. Um, Jose, would you like to share anything about the the topic? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is this repo was a request from uh, our annual review from CNCF, and they asked us to have a go to place with cent to centralize information about how the project is structured who maintain it, what, how can I, a new contributors help and this kind of thing. So we have this community repo, which store all, all of this um, uh, information. Maybe the most coolest thing is the repositories and their description states and what scope they go to in the project. And you can find each definition of scope and status in the same repository. So. Uh, it's a place to centralize important information to know how Kubernetes project work as a whole, like what each repository does, with who maintain what, and this kind of thing. So it's a, a CNCF request, and we address that to move forward in our process in, in, inside the foundation. So, yeah. Yeah, this is super nice. I'm super happy about it. Uh, I hope that we you know, keep improving it. And yeah. about um, talking about CNCF, um, we have the, the last step, no, for, for CNCF um, current um, step, which is the domain transfer. And we are working on that, no? And once we are done with that, we will move forward and try to, to yeah? Yeah, actually, to move, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry. The domain transfer is not the last one, but the one before that, which is we move the our Kubo um, domain from SUSE registry to CNCF one, so it's under their control now. And the last thing in the onboarding process for the Sandbox project is the web analytics stuff, which is in progress. I'm talking to them when during right now, but. Uh, it's a pretty simple one, so I would say that we will be able to do that soon, uh, but yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Okay. Um, apart from the community repo and CNCF topics, we have uh, the container resource policy. This container resource policy had, has has had some changes lately. Uh, yeah. Jose? 
Yeah, this is one of our latest policies, which is basically used to validate the limits and requests, resource limits and resource requests from the uh, resources deploying in the cluster. In the original version, we just ensure that values are validated and under the specified configuration, but a user from the community ask it, I don't want to validate uh, the values. I, don't, I, I just want to make sure that they are there no matter what. So they update the policy, we review, we release, and now we, the policy can be used not only for validate, it can be used to just say, yeah, it's there, go ahead, you can deploy it, or it's there, but it's invalid. You need to change the values to be allowed to be deployed. So this is a community improvement, and we would like to mention that in the, the call. Okay, sounds good. And so that means that then it can be used for monitoring. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the um, question, is that already out or should we expect another uh, patch release of the policy? Uh, it's out, but we we find a, a little problem during the past week and we fix it already. So the latest version in the registry, like the latest tag of the OCI artifact has the fix. But we don't release it yet because we would like to update some metadata information the policy before releasing the Artifact Hub. So, but it will be land there pretty soon, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. And as always, everything is on the on the GitHub repos. So, okay. And that brings us to the last topic for today. Unless uh, you guys uh, and folks uh, from from home want to raise any other topic is the upcoming 113 release. So of course that's gonna take a bit now because we are still with our series for 1.12. But we can see here we have listed already um, a bit of improvements in the policy server memory usage, which is already planned, and some uh, controller optimizations. Maybe going to the milestone would be a good idea. Um, Flavio, do you, would you feel yeah, I'm thinking about yeah. the, the memories uh, issues on the policy server. I would like to know more about that. Yeah, sure. So the memory issue of the policy server is, uh, is specific to, uh, again, uh, context-aware information. And uh, especially when you are pulling information from really big clusters. So we have community members who are pulling information like um, namespaces, ingresses, uh, cluster role bindings, and role bindings. And uh, the number of these resources is, is pretty high, like uh, 3,200 uh, namespaces and uh, something like uh, 1,000 uh, 1, uh, ingresses, where the ingress is, uh, is an object that has uh, many, many sections inside of it, so it can grow uh, bigger. So if you're dealing with uh, clusters that don't, have, that don't have this scale, you're, you, you have probably never experienced this problem before. But we do have some users who, who run into, you know, this, uh, this circumstances with really big clusters. And so we are going to provide a solution to, to, this, uh, to this problem. And uh, basically, the, I don't know if we should go too deep into that, or I mean, there is an RFC Sweet. that describes okay. that, but yeah, True. It's, it's always a bit uh, tricky, but um, the key point is right now, um, everything is kept in memory. And of course, the more stuff you add in memory, the more memory is used and you can run into and out of, of memory killer because of that. So we will offload some of this data to a file system cache. And um, we are going to use SQLite to do that because it does an amazing job of, at you know, uh, handling this kind of information. It will allow us to, to do uh, some optimization based on, you know, the policies and what the requests, you know, share information between uh, between them. And so this is the RFC that describes uh, how we structure the, the table and, you know, how we keep it up to date. What I really want to stress out is that this is uh, something that is ephemeral. So we, we will not require you to have a persistent storage, no persistent storage at all, because this is just a cache, a snapshot of what is inside of the cluster is going to be kept up to date uh, like we, we currently do. The only difference is instead of keeping everything in memory, we will you know flash some data 
into into the file system and let SQLite deal with uh, with you know keeping the the, the, the data in memory and uh, the other one in on the file system. So yeah, that's what we are planning to do. Sounds great. Okay, and that's for and that's for the memory consumption. And uh, do you want me for to do all the other one? Yeah, you can. I was thinking about the the. Um, so this is um, specific. I mean, we hit the, this for Rigo, no policies, context aware. Yes, yes. So this is uh, so um, we have to. Well, we we you can write policies with different languages with keyboard. And so when you're using policies written with with Rigo, the way it uh, it currently works is we are mimicking the behavior. Of, of gatekeeper so that you can take your gatekeeper policies and run them on top of keyboard and without doing any change. The uh, gatekeeper implementation works uh, by pulling all of this information from the Kubernetes cluster and making it all available to the policy. So uh, if you have a policy that uh, needs uh, access to ingresses, then uh, we are going to fetch, in, in the example from the issue, you're going to fetch uh, a thousand ingress uh, objects and, and just keep them in memory. And every time you have a policy that uh, wants to, you know, to do something with ingresses, it will give all this information to the policy. Um, this is, uh, however, not uh, really optimized because in some circumstances, for example, you, you, you probably don't care about all the ingresses. You just care about knowing if uh, Maybe an ingress with a specific uh, name exists. Now, the, the ingress example is, is probably not the best one, but you know, for namespaces, for example, uh, what you care is maybe an, does is there a namespace with uh, this name or with this uh, label? You know, with the label uh, team equal to uh, a certain value. So you, you're basically looking for for uh, for a needle in the haystack, uh, where the haystack is like a thousand ingresses. If you're writing instead a policy which um, which uses uh, uh, our SDKs for Rust or for Go, you don't have to, you know, uh, do a give a query of give me everything, all the ingresses, so that then I policy can look into the haystack and find, you know, the exact things. What you could do is to make specific queries like give me all the pods that have these labels or give me the namespace with this name. And so you make a specific request. And because of that, you, you just get back uh, the, the, the specific amount of information. Now, this is something that would make the policy execution faster in terms of memory usage. Uh, it will not change anything because we will still be uh, you know, doing uh, this optimization behind the scene with SQLite. But in terms of uh, execution uh, time, uh, the, the policies written with our SDKs are going to be faster you know, in these circumstances because you have to exchange less data. Instead of uh, sending back and forth a thousand ingresses, maybe you send back and forth a hundred ingress objects. You know? And so what we are discussing with the community is, and community seems to be interested into that, is uh, about extending the, the regal language that we, we support, uh, basically uh, introduce some new functions, some as regal calls them built-ins. So introduce maybe a built-in that uh, uh, instead, uh, that basically allows to, to query resources in a specific way like our SDK do, so that the amount of information shared is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is less, you know. But this is not part of 113. Uh, this is something for the future, but if this is something that you will be interested about or if you are against it, just uh, let us know and uh, we'll be happy to discuss that. We are having some conversation with some community members, but, uh, you know, the more the merrier. Yep, that sounds good. Good, good overview, to be honest. <laughs> And about uh, 113, yeah, I'm talking about um, community-driven things, yeah, to be honest. Everything that we do is community driven, no, in a way. I mean, you can see in the 1.12 things that were driven and um, by community. So we are happy about that. About the 113, we have also controller optimizations uh, listed. Yeah. I suppose that means, uh, yeah, events and things on how things work on the, in the controller. Yeah, um, this is uh, related with um, 
an issue that has been reported uh, again by some community members on, on, on big clusters. And the issue is about um, uh, our uh, controller making a lot of requests against uh, the Kubernetes API server. And so uh, we will uh, tackle down this issue uh, so far. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's really annoying. It's really annoying. Yeah. So totally forgot about that one. I was thinking more about, uh, you know, controller, controller um, refactorings and tech debt and so on, which we yes, also that's for with. sure. Yeah. That's for sure. We have also some some refactoring uh, planned, some some tech debt that we want to to address. Uh, yes, but Definitely. yeah, that's. That's way, yeah, that's way important. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, we are not talking about the cell policy either, um, which is still there. We want to work on it yeah. and we will schedule that. I would love that. to have it out. Yeah. We haven't yet done, a, a, you know, the planning for 113. So this is also exactly. a good chance, you know, for, for, for the community to, to reach out and say, I really care about uh, this change, uh, this fix, this improvement, so that we can schedule accordingly. But yeah, the cell policy is on the top of my list. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's a good, yeah, it. <laughs> it's a good feature, but uh, yeah. it's good to work on on things important. Okay, um, yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, I see some people have joined also. Me while we started and so on. If uh, you guys have any other topics or you would like to talk about anything or present yourselves, uh, feel free. I see some uh, nodding heads, but that's okay. No problem. Thanks for joining though. And for those uh, seeing us from, from home and in the recording, well, thanks for listening to us. A last call for topics. I don't see any then. Well, uh, it's been a, a wonderful meeting and we hope to see you on next ones. Uh, enjoy that then. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.